all very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here today to the 100 Resilient Cities kickoff in the city of Pittsburgh. My name is Grant Irvin. I serve as a sustainability manager for the city of Pittsburgh in the office of Mayor William Peduto. Uh, so it's with great excitement today that I, we all come together for what is really a fabulous opportunity to kickstart a very serious and intentional community conversation. What I want to do today is give you a little bit of a framework in terms of the day's events, cover a little bit of housekeeping, and then introduce Chief of Staff to Mayor William Peduto, Kevin Acklin. So the frame of the day, you are here because of who you are. You've been recognized as being leaders, as being catalysts, as being essential members of the Pittsburgh community in our conversation and our journey to becoming a more resilient city. The purpose of today is to put you to work. You're not here for the muffins and the coffee and the lunch. You're not here to catch up with friends. All those are great benefits. We're here for your ideas. We're here for your energy. And we're here because we have an opportunity to make a pivotal change in the city of Pittsburgh. And you're a part of that process. Today's event is the kickoff of the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program. The city of Pittsburgh was selected a few months ago to join a cohort of cities around the world who are on a journey to define, to determine what it means to be a resilient city. It's a path, it's a progress, it's a little ambiguous, but it's an opportunity to shape the future. One of the things as a sustainability manager I've come to recognize is that the 21st century will be the century of the city. It's an opportunity for us as a global network to help shape the course of the next generation. And that shape and that progress begins within cities. Today's event will share conversations, will work through an exercise, you'll have table facilitators, note takers, what we need and what we want from you is your ideas, your energy, and the opportunities you see to help shape the future of Pittsburgh. This morning, you're going to hear from a panel of experts. You're going to hear from Chief Acklin, who are going to help frame the day. You're going to hear from Brian Lipper from the 100 Resilient Cities program to help give us a sense of context of where we're positioned in the world, the opportunity that is presenting Pittsburgh. And then, after lunch, you're going to hear from Mayor Peduto. Mayor Peduto is going to set us on a course, provide us with a bit of vision, and then in the afternoon we'll roll up our sleeves and get to work. At the end of the day, we'll have a foundation that is going to start to set our course for the development of a resilient strategy. All of you and many people who are, aren't in the room are going to be critical assets in the development of that strategy and the fulfillment of that vision. In order to start the day off, we've asked Kevin Acklin, Chief of Staff for Mayor William Peduto, to help set some, set some foundation for us, to give us a reality check, to understand the good things and the bad things that we see in the paper every day, and the daily course or daily discourse that occurs in City Hall. Kevin has a great opportunity in his position as Chief of Staff to see it all. Literally the buck stops at Kevin's desk. Decisions get made every day, rightly or wrongly, <laughs> mostly rightly. Mostly rightly, in terms of putting Pittsburgh on a path. And Kevin's going to share with you some stories and opportunities that he sees in his daily life that can help us shape our conversation here today. It's with great honor that I introduce Chief of Staff to Mayor William Peduto, Kevin Acklin. Chief Acklin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Grant. And uh, before I begin, I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of you. Uh, I think we're all here uh, for the same reason, whether we work in government or uh, in the nonprofit community or in the foundation community. Uh, we're here to serve uh, the city. We're here to serve the residents of the city. And uh, when I look around the room, uh, you know, this administration, uh, it's been an honor uh, to serve in this role. Uh, in, in work directly with all of you. You're an amazing group of people. and. Uh, just want to give uh, a, a tremendous thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation for pulling us all together today. If you look at this administration from my lens, uh, you know, we, about three years before this race, uh, you know, Bill and I, Dan Gilman, a couple others, 
got together for beer, right? And we start talking about on a Sunday night, and that became a campaign that led to reaching out to national uh, leaders, which led to a conversation I remember with Deborah Lamb before she was even hired. And we talked about the Rocker Founda Rockefeller Foundation application for Resilient City. I remember where I was. I was in my backyard uh, with my kids running around. We hadn't even started this administration yet. And to look here today, those conversations, which were nascent at the time, uh, to bring everybody together to do something great for the residents of the city. So it's a little bit overwhelming uh, to see the outcome of that. But I think there's a lesson there uh, that there's not anything we can't accomplish uh, as a city. Uh, this is a town different than other cities that you can pull everybody in a room. Uh, and get st something done, uh, you know, assess priorities and, and move things forward. So um, I just wanted to, to, to make a personal uh, uh, statement about that. And again, I appreciate everybody's efforts. If you think of resilience, what we're here to talk about today, I think about the history of our city. If you pick any period in time, Pittsburgh's faced its challenges and we battled adversity uh, for sure. If you look in uh, the dictionary, if those exist anymore. I guess if you look on Wikipedia uh, for what it means to be a resilient city, I would expect the city of Pittsburgh to pop up. Whether it was the first global conflict back at the French and Indian War just down the river here at the forks uh, of the Ohio, uh, to the impact of our rapid industrialization, uh, the results of our immigration boom here at the turn of the 20th century, or the collapse of that same economic might and rapid population loss in the 60s and 70s. Growing up here, as I did, as many of you did, you know what it means to adjust, to reposition ourselves, to survive. And personally, I grew up uh, in, in Pittsburgh. I'm a, uh, my great-grandfather moved here from Ireland, like many of your ancestors, to, to work in the mills. Uh, I lived in an area of the city that overlooked uh, the Elmano site, which we're all working on today. I remember the mill workers parked outside of my house uh, to, to walk across the bridge that used to be on, uh, on the Parkway West. Uh, I remember when they stopped coming, uh, when we lost a whole generation of workers. Uh, I call that Steeler Nation. That's why our teams travel so well, right? Because we lost folks to other cities, and we're now at a position uh, to really rebuild that. And as city leaders, everyone in this room, uh, we have a, a broad platform of services and responsibilities. Uh, as the chief of staff to the mayor, I also serve as our chief development officer. Uh, I chair our redevelopment th authority as well. I see firsthand those obstacles, the day-to-day -day challenges that we face, and the successes that we collectively take every day. Cities are dynamic, always changing. They literally never sleep. I don't get much sleep either but, uh, with the job, but having been in this position for about 18 months now um, in our administration, we've made several strides, we've tackled some issues, but we have several core uh, challenges that remain. Something I tell our staff every day is you have a limited time in this role in an administration. Uh, I tell them to make a list of what you want to accomplish for the time that you're here. Uh, and we have to take that, responsible, that responsibility seriously, and we do. Our best efforts can only position the city for a stronger future. Every action we take has a reaction, and hopefully a positive one. And managing and mitigating risk of those decisions is my job, is what I do on behalf of the mayor every day, whether it's decisions about uh, political decisions or about allocation of capital. Uh, one thing I like to say is, you know, we have uh, a lot of energy happening in this town. We have a building boom underway. Uh, downtown, uh, I see Jeremy here from the PDP is one of our, is I believe, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, is our strongest growing residential neighborhood in the city. But we have whole swaths of neighborhoods in the city that haven't shared in that prosperity. That's the second Pittsburgh. That's what I came here to focus on. I came here uh, previously as a transactional lawyer. Uh, it's easy to work on deals when the, eco the economics are there, but the mission, our, our challenge is to focus on rebuilding the areas of the cities, invest investing in people where the economics don't flow. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. Preparing for what's next for both Pittsburghs and placing the city on a course that enables us to be recognized as a global leader, a world-class city, a place to start a company, to raise a family, is what we're all here to work towards. towards. And the question facing me and all of us today, and I want you to keep this in mind, is what keeps you up at night? We need to know your nightmares, and together we can construct a plan for facing them for the betterment of our city. 
And so today, Pittsburgh is thrilled to join this network of cities from around the world to learn to share and grow is our exciting proposition. And the challenges being faced in one city are often replicated, but they're certainly not isolated. Uh, one thing every six months, uh, the chiefs of staff for different mayors get together, we go up to Harvard and we sit around a table and talk, complain about our bosses. <laughs> But one thing, uh, after we get done with complaining, uh, we realize we're all in the same boat. We have the same challenges. Some are different scale. Uh, there's an Andy Butcher from Boston. Uh, there's other folks, uh, and, and that's something in this position, which is uh, I increasingly um, to rely on that advice from others, uh, other cities that are going through the same thing, and that's something I know that Rockefeller being one of these the peer groups is very important for us to learn from. But our challenge is to attract the capital and the talent that leverages our strengths while mitigating our deficiencies that is paramount to the city of Pittsburgh's success. Which is why being named one of Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities is such an honor and an opportunity. We look forward to embarking on this journey as a community with the 100 Resilient Cities program into demonstrating the possibilities that are Pittsburgh. And so I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Keep in mind in your daily job what keeps you up at night. Tell us your stories. Collectively, we can come together and, and build a, a more stronger, resilient city. So I, I, again, want to thank you for your time, your energy, your input, and more importantly, your passion and your contributions for the people, the residents of the city of Pittsburgh. Thank you very much. And next, I, I want to introduce uh, Bryna Lipper, the Vice President for Relationships at 100 Resilient Cities. Bryna is the VP of Relationships for 100 Resilient Cities prior to joining 100 Resilient Cities. She held leadership roles in government, nonprofit, and private sector organizations dedicated to advancing the quality of urban life. Most recently, she was the Director of Philanthropic Research and Initiatives for the Office of International and Philanthropic Innovation at the U.S. Department of Housing and, and Urban Development. So ladies and gentlemen, very pleased to introduce Bryna Lipper. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief Acklin. That was a really inspiring speech and a really inspiring vision. Um, I. Uh, I thought it might be great just to reflect on that comment about the two Pittsburghs for just a moment, because I think that that's what we're real realizing in cities that we travel to internationally in this program. The issue of social cohesion, the issue of equity, the issue of economic opportunity, particularly for cities that are becoming reimagined is such a significant resilience challenge and opportunity at the same time, and I think that that is an extraordinary vision for this great city. It is my first time in the city of Pittsburgh, I am now ashamed to say. Um, I, uh, as, as was mentioned, I work for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, so U.S. cities actually were uh, a, a part of my uh, kind of constitution. And um, I hadn't traveled here before, but coming in last night, uh, I arrived just as the sun was setting at dusk. It was an enlightenment for me. I knew that this city was described as the Paris of Appalachia, and I knew that this city was described as the city of bridges. Um, I had actually worked uh, once on a youth education program about the engineering of the bridges in the city, but had never seen them for myself. myself. And I just have to say, what a beautiful, glorious surprise of a gem uh, that is here uh, and you all kind of own and are responsible for. And I think that that's also a really compelling vision for this city is, the responsibility that everyone has to contribute to that vision of not just two cities, but how do we unite the two sides of Pittsburgh um, for one great city of the future. And that's what resilience is all about. So without further ado, let me launch into, oh dear, 
they told me I needed to know how to work this clicker, and I didn't. Um, 100 Resilient Cities. So 100 Resilient Cities partners with cities from around the world to foster urban resilience to social, economic, and physical challenges, um, growing part of the 21st century. Um, and I wanted to uh, kick this off by uh, uh, showing you and sharing with you a video um, of, uh, I think we had teed up, uh, a video about 100 Resilient Cities for a quick introduction. Urbanization is extremely rapid and cities across the world are challenged. We all have common threats. When the water rises, it wets everybody. Yo pienso que lo más importante, y sin duda Medellín tiene mucho, mucho que aprender de otras ciudades. You have 100 cities that will be learning from each other, and this network is something unique. The first 33 cities were named. Since then, we've been working with points of contact in each city to begin to implement the 100 Resilient Cities program. We live in a physically vulnerable place. More tough things are coming our way. We're not the only ones that are vulnerable. And it seems that cities across the world are. Biblos, it's the oldest inhabited city in the world. Nevertheless, after 6,000 or 8,000 years, it, is, uh, it has shocks and stresses that hinder or that threaten the city. Para nós, resiliência é, acima de tudo, a capacidade de fortalecer as condições vitais da cidade. Inequity is a huge problem, not only in Colombia, but in Medellin. When you live in a developing country and a city where a lot of people come to dream, it's to me very important building the resilience of the individual to be able to move on those dreams. It's about climate change, it's about heat waves, but it also should be about things that people take on every day in their real life, economic downturns, poverty, violence. These are things that have just as much of an impact on their lives as a large earthquake. The whole idea of resilience is if you spend more money on the front end being smart, you'll spend much less money on the back end and you'll save a lot of lives, so why wait? We wanted to do a broad stakeholder meeting to introduce the concept of resilience, to identify challenges, opportunities, risks, and really lay out what uh, the agenda for the resilience building effort might be. But the critical moments to us are when the city really recognizes that it has a variety of different stresses that they need to focus on as well. These slow burning issues that exist despite a shock. One of the things we've learned already is that we are very focused on a disaster or a major event. What this process is really teaching us is there are commonalities of how to strengthen our society and our communities that will benefit us in any kind of event. One of the most innovative offerings of 100RC is this platform of tools and resources. These are funding opportunities, best practices, technology, technical assistance, both from the public and private sector, uh, that cities will be able to tap into more efficiently and that will serve as a distribution mechanism. We're in the midst of developing a new urban resilience initiative and the definition actually parallels very closely what the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative is trying to do. It's critical for us that these issues get on the agenda. That's where the partnerships come in. That's where a group like 100 Resilient Cities comes in. They are there on the ground generating the ideas, generating the information, and ultimately generating the investment projects. That can change the dialogue. It can change the number of cities who are focused on these issues. Each of the cities has a unique risk profile. What we're really trying to convey is the importance of building economic resilience so that we can build resilience in all the other areas that we're focused on. Figuring out a coordinated way to promote that message, make sure that these cities are embedding that into their culture is something that we're trying to achieve. And using the initiative and having an audience of 100 cities that are all excited to really build resilience provides us with the right forum to do that. If we're going to improve the resilience of cities, we need to be able to know where we're going and we need to be able to measure resilience. When we started to develop 
the City Resilience Framework, which is a holistic understanding of what city resilience really means, we hadn't identified an end user. The fact that the Rockefeller Foundation announced the 100 Resilient Cities program, there are suddenly potentially 100 cities for who this framework is directly useful. What will come afterwards is that almost every philanthropic organisation, a whole range of institutional investors will say, we want resilient cities. I would say this is an historic occasion. All of the issues from equity to urban planning and design to safety or law, innovative financing, will be more successful and long-lasting if done through the lens of building urban resilience. One of the things that's exciting about doing these workshops back to back is our ability to recognize patterns both in the challenges that these cities face, but also in the solutions. And that's really going to be the promise, being able to distribute common solutions to many of our cities and doing it more efficiently and at scale. They recognize the need to partner with us rather than view us as traditional grant makers and collaborate so that they can achieve their unique vision of resilience for their city. It's always embarrassing to see yourself on film. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as I was as I was uh, indicating earlier, um, 100 Resilient Cities was formed in the year 2013, just a, a brief uh, 20 months or so ago, uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, with now what totals an investment of over 160 million dollars to partner with 100 cities around the world to catalyze the practice of urban resilience in partnership with municipal governments. Um, one of the things that we have recognized that is so critical and so crucial to develop uh, resilience within cities is innovative leadership within the city structure itself. And Mayor Peduto, we found as one of those extraordinary cases of a real innovator, somebody who is practicing, um, experimenting, practicing with uh, city structures, uh, trying out new municipal government styles, um, trying to partner in different ways with philanthropy, trying to partner in different ways with uh, academic institutions, and trying to find new kinds of partnerships and investments for this great city. And that is a key ingredient in all of our 67 cities so far, that kind of catalytic leadership to experiment. And we know that that is also a key ingredient for building resilience within cities. 100 Resilient Cities tries to aim to solve two problems. First of all, we recognize that the cities are incredibly complex ecosystems. Um, the management of cities moving forward into the 21st centuries um, cannot any longer operate in system silos. Thinking about housing separate from transportation, separate from energy systems, and separate from the public sector and the private sector differentiation can no longer work. We have to find integrated systems and break down the silos so that when we think about interdependencies and in systems, we know how we can operate in a in concert together to reduce our risks for the future. Secondly, existing solutions don't scale or reach cities efficiently. Cities tend to recreate things again and again and again uh, independently of one another. One of the things that we were so inspired to hear about Mayor Peduto in particular was his outreach to other cities around the world to learn about what works, what works best, and how can we bring some of those ideas back to the city of Pittsburgh and experiment. One of the things that we're also realizing is the private sector, whether that be commercial businesses, uh, uh, academic institutions, philanthropy, have ideas, have solutions and tools that already exist to provide resources to cities. So together, if we can connect the dots between number one and two, break down the city silos, and help connect with existing resources of what works to build resilience in cities, we've already come a long way to providing 
resilience building solutions to cities. 100 Resilient Cities was designed to solve, uh, or is designed to provide four different offerings to cities. The first of which is a chief resilience officer, a senior official that will be hired within the municipal government, reporting directly to the mayor and the chief of staff often, uh, to coordinate all of those uh, 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 silo busting efforts and to coordinate a resilient strategy uh, so that the city and all of your officials can help implement implement your vision, your unique vision for resilience in the city. The second thing that we provide is resources to that chief resilience officer to build a resilient strategy, a six to nine month effort within the city to identify actions, activities that are already great activities that are underway in the city to build resilience and to connect all of those dots across the silos and to find and discover new opportunities to build resilience within the city. In order to help you with that, in order to help the cities with implementing those resilient strategies, we, d we have developed a platform of tools and services with great partners, great global partners from around the world. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit, but those tools and services that already exist at scale and providing each one of our cities with pro bono resources to help implement their strategies is a key ingredient to our vision of building resilience in the future. And then finally, the network working across 100 different cities to find best practices, to advocate for uh, changes in policies at state, federal, national, and even international levels to build resilience, finding and discovering funding opportunities. Our network of chief resilience officers will work together on a collective resilience vision uh, for, the, for the entire world. So who is this chief resilience officer? In our organization, we like to call this individual the unicorn. Um, it's this magical creature with extraordinary abilities to convene the cities and work across all of those silos. He or she will serve as a senior official advising the mayor um, or municipal leaders um, and help broker opportunities um, for resilience thinking and act as both that local thought leader to achieve your unique vision, um, but also act as a global leader to convene resources for this city. This individual will also coordinate resilience uh, efforts um, with multi-sector stakeholders. One of the things that we've found that's absolutely crucial and I would imagine is for this city in particular is harnessing the wisdom, uh, the experience, and the uh, incredible resources of uh, all of your anchor institutions, for example. How do we mobilize your community groups for that one Pittsburgh vision? Uh, how do we work with the private sector to advocate for responsible growth and opportunity in the future. And then finally, this chief resilience officer, our unicorn, will liaise with uh, other CROs from around the world, uh, bring you best practices, identify resources that are ripe for the city of Pittsburgh, um, and liaise with the service providers uh, through our platform, bringing you uh, the best in class tools and resources to implement resilience programs. The resilient strategy that this individual will lead is uh, uh, an exciting invention and experiment that's going on right now with uh, about 28 cities from the first wave of 100 resilient cities. Um, it starts out with a very broad diagnostic effort of resilience in each individual city. What is the state of resilience today in the city of Pittsburgh? And your chief resilience officer will work with all of you, hopefully, and will experiment a little bit of that with that today, is diagnosing the capacity for resilience in the city. What are your strengths and weaknesses? What are the shocks and stresses? What are the existing activities that are underway? And come up with a state of resilience in the city. After that, the chief resilience officer will work with all of you and the mayor to determine what specifically you want to focus on to build resilience in this city um, and complete a set of specific initiatives to get underway that we can help you mobilize. In order to help with that mobilization around those initiatives, um, because they will be uh, 
a range of different things from policy interventions uh, to hopefully you will envision some capital projects, some major activities uh, that the city wants to move forward for uh, a new vision of itself in the 21st century. In order to do that, we have convened, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a, a wide variety of different partners, global partners um, with expertise in different kinds of activities from technology um, to uh, scientific analysis to uh, commercial tools and financial resources. And I'd just like to pause to describe a little bit of some examples of what's happening in cities today to give you a little paint a little picture. So City Mart that you see sort of down at the bottom is working right now with the city of Da Nang, who I know is a sister city to Pittsburgh, uh, working with the city of Oakland, um, and also working with the city of Bristol in the UK on an effort to identify social cohesion tools and solutions that will work in those cities. All of those cities that I just described, as you might imagine, have the tale of two cities uh, existing in their context. They have people without access to economic opportunity. They have race issues uh, that are uh, causing conflict and strife. They have immigration issues that they don't exactly know how to solve through policies. So City Mart is working with each of those uh, cities to identify solutions that might be appropriate to help them think about and solve some of those problems. Um, Palantir is an extraordinary technology innovation, uh, uh, innovator that deals with uh, incredibly complex data systems. Um, and they're working with municipal governments, including our, uh, uh, our city to the south, Norfolk, Virginia, and helping identify the intersection of um, uh, uh, climate change and rising sea levels, um, housing patterns, and um, uh, policing and violence data. So it's a great opportunity to look at how to integrate complex in a, uh, information for decision making. And then finally, Veolia that you'll see at the top is an exceptional commercial uh, uh, business outside that's based outside of Paris. And they work in water and waste management systems primarily. And they're consulting with the city of Rio to look at um, how to manage a 40% loss of water that goes through the system uh, uh, once it reaches its final destination. F uh, fresh water system, the loss of 40% of clean water to its residents is a significant burden um, on the municipal government, as you can imagine. So Veolia is consulting them with opportunities uh, to look at 21st century uh, infrastructure systems. And of course, the 100 Resilient Cities Network uh, is uh, an incredible opportunity for the city and the chief resilience officer uh, to think about um, uh, collaborating with partners from around the world. Um, already we're seeing this network work in incredible ways. In, this, in the state of California, three chief resilience officers are collaborating right now on policy advocacy for the state of uh, within the state of California and Sacramento to change laws and legislation to enable them to enact uh, policy change for resilience. In Europe, many of our member cities convened uh, to solicit uh, the European Union for, and were successful in achieving a 150 uh, million euro grant to build resilience among their cities. Um, and. Uh, four of our cities from around the world who you wouldn't expect to have a tremendous amount in common, the city of New Orleans, uh, Melbourne, Australia, uh, Semarang, Indonesia, and Durban, South Africa, are collaborating to research on biodiversity and water systems change in the face of climate change and how that affects um, uh, uh, th water threats that they're going to have in the 21st century and looking at biodiversity. So you can imagine collaborating with among these different, um, these 100 cities to find different ideas, solutions, collaborate on policy, and hopefully funding opportunities. Um, these are our applicant cities. 
uh, we've received um, about 700 different applications from uh, our two rounds currently, and uh, we're just getting underway for our third round of funding to complete our 100 different cities. And we have selected a total of 67 cities from um, over 700 different applications. So the success rate of getting into 100 resilient cities is less than 10%. So you can imagine how extraordinary the application from Pittsburgh must have been to be invited into this network. So a quick introduction as fast as I can into what, 100, what resilience is. Um, urban resilience, as we define it, is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, and systems within a city the whole of a city, not just municipal government, but all of the systems and people, to adapt and grow no matter what kind of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. And I'm, I'll just take a pause for a moment about that definition to say what's kind of been commonly known in cities prior to um, uh, at least a decade of work that the Rockefeller had done prior to 100 resilient cities um, being invented is cities commonly are aware of resilience issues as it relates to those acute shocks. Um, a cataclysmic earthquake, a hurricane that devastates an island city, um, uh, a another type of disaster event that occurs. Building resilience to those kind of shocks has been a practice that um, many cities are acquainted with and very familiar with. But as we began to look at cities' ability to survive, adapt, and grow, we realized that preparing for and addressing those chronic stresses, things that erode or corrode a city, as I described earlier. Economic, uh, a lack of economic diversity, a lack of investment in infrastructure, um, chronic social cohesion issues are strife. Those are the kinds of things that actually tend to bring cities to their knees when they have an acute shock. So imagine, if you will, a place like New Orleans before Hurricane Katrina, and imagine the racial tensions that existed in that city, the chronic and endemic poverty that existed, the lack of affordable housing that existed, the lack of investment in any infrastructure um, to provide for its future. And then you imagine hurricanes Katrina and Rita hitting that city, and the difficulty, the complexity, the pain of rebuilding that kind of place, given those chronic stresses, are also what we're here to focus on. Um, and so, when we talk about resilience, oftentimes we like to think about four different trends and the urgency of building resilience in cities. And one of those, of course, is um, human migration to cities. Um, urban growth, as we all probably know here in this room, um, is is growing at an exponential rate, rate, uh, rate into cities. 1.4 million new people moving to cities every week is a statistic. The other very commonly known statistic is it's projected that by the year 2050, um, 70 to 75 percent of human population will live in cities. In some regions of the world, um, particularly South America and parts of Asia, that's already eclipsed today. So we know that cities are not only going to be the hub of innovation and opportunity, but they're also the hub of potential threats and condensation of these particular threats. The other uh, 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 trend that we're seeing and uh, kind of inspiration for 100 resilient cities is what I just talked about. 
the ability of a, system, uh, of a city um, to face not only those acute shocks, but also those chronic stresses. And you see here um, on the left a picture of um, uh, 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 in Mandalay, Myanmar, and the city faces um, kind of a constant reoccurring shock, uh, which is constant flooding in its in its cities in its city, and you can imagine with constant flooding conditions and a lack of infrastructure, the conditions for public health, as it relates to a threat like flooding, escalates uh, tenfold. So looking at these city systems in integrated ways is another critical part of what we ask cities to do. Of course, on the right, you're seeing the aban an abandoned steel, steel mill in this city, uh, this very city. Um, and one of the things, one of the trends that we realize around the world is any city's dependence upon a singular macroeconomic uh, 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 state uh, around the steel industry or around the automotive industry. A lack of diversity is one of the things that we're seeing um, perpetuates a lack of resilience in cities around the world. So the qualities of resilient cities, what are the behaviors? What are the um, performance ways to look at resilience within any given system, uh, within any given system? Um, we like to think of these seven different qualities as a way to really diagnose resilience within a city. Some of these are individual behaviors or human behaviors. Some of these are um, patterns or uh, uh, characteristics or performance that we see in infrastructure systems. So, of course, being reflective is about an individual um, or about a human's capacity to reflect and learn. How often is it, it, it that you and your organization take a moment to say, how are these policies actually working for us? Being reflective in that way helps you iterate and innovate in a very rapid way. How resourceful are we? Can we easily repurpose our, uh, our resources? This is another trend that we're seeing in cities. The ability of an institution to look at its personnel in a new way or look at how they deploy their resources um, and how, uh, uh, how calcified those systems are to that kind of change is a quality of resilience. How robust is a system? Um, and how, ro how redundant is a system has to do with uh, uh, physical assets often of a city um, and natural resources of a city um, to limit the spread of failure and have uh, capacity buildup in case something breaks down in one particular area. Um, flexibility also has to do with that kind of system threat. Um, so how can we build in alternative systems um, to one system, for example, an energy system? Um, we look at integration, of course, in, in terms of uh, how systems work together. I described a little while ago about how important it is to break down silos. Um, when we work together in integrated ways and look at the relationship between our health system, our infrastructure system, and our transportation system, we realize patterns uh, that we can work with together in the future to reduce our threats and risk and potentially co-invest and get maximum gain. Um, and then uh, we also realize that an, another kind of pattern or trend um, that we're seeing is these accumulating stresses can lead to social breakdown, physical collapse, or economic decline. Um, so the buildup, the description that I just offered of New Orleans um, is if a city lets these sort of patterns erode and build up over time when threats occur, when uh, either natural or human and man-made threats occur, the city's ability to bounce back from those kinds of threats um, is significantly reduced. 
Um, so here's just a quick list of shocks and stresses. Uh, when we talk about those, it's, it's often that many of our cities, particularly um, US cities, will see many different kinds of threats on both sides of this category. Um, so uh, acute shocks, uh, of course, flooding, this, this, this city uh, unfortunately faces as well as severe storms. Um, and can probably see itself in a couple of other categories of, uh, of those acute shocks, those violent catastrophic episodes that will hit a city. The chronic stresses, of course, um, I imagine that you see reflected in, unfortunately, in the uh, city of Pittsburgh um, on this list as well. Um, for instance, changing demographics that the chief of staff just spoke about, uh, looking at uh, high rates of unemployment um, that you're already recovering from um, in some pretty inspiring ways. Uh, uh, crime and violence issues, uh, very kind of common in uh, this city. Lack of affordable housing um, or homelessness. Um, I was looking at the city's goal of reducing um, homelessness and veterans homelessness, um, which was a, another inspiring goal and objective that the mayor has, but also relates to um, the city's resilience overall. So when we look at these shocks and stresses, they bring opportunities for the cities to evolve and in some circumstances transform. So what you're seeing in this diagram is what we like to think about as taking the opportunity when a crisis hits, when a challenge hits, when a stress undermines the city, how using that crisis, using those moments of bringing a city to its needs, knees, creates an opportunity for innovation, reinvention. And one of the things I think that we're finding so inspiring about Pittsburgh is you're already on that evolutionary path. So some cities, unfortunately, as you can see in the dotted line, when they have a threat, when they have a shock or stress, um, they, their pattern of a development, unfortunately, goes through a very serious rapid decline. And what we're seeing with the city of Pittsburgh and the great opportunity here is you've already taken some extraordinary measures to begin evolving beyond your path of development, perhaps before the great economic decline. Um, and as you saw in the video, uh, Joe De Silva from the Arab Corporation has been working with the Rockefeller Foundation for many, many years on developing a system to analyze resilience within cities. We call this the City Resilience Framework, and we'll be working with all of you today um, and with the city of uh, Pittsburgh moving forward as a way to measure and analyze uh, the capacity of resilience within the city. It has four different dimensions um, in this very holistic way to analyze resilience. The the first of which being health and well-being, the second economy and society, the third infrastructure and environment, and the fourth leadership and strategy. And within each of those four different dimensions that I talked about, you can imagine that there are indicators, there are ways that we would look at subcategories, what we call drivers of resilience, to analyze the conditions in the city. So health and well-being is really all about meeting basic needs, supporting livelihood and employment, and ensuring public health services. E economy and society is about fostering economic prosperity, ensuring social stability and social justice, promoting cohesive and engaged communities. A lot of what uh, uh, the chief of staff just talked about. Um, infrastructure and environment is about your physical and natural assets and how you preserve and maintain those. So man-made assets, critical infrastructure and natural assets. And finally, leadership and strategy, promoting effective management within the city, empowering a range of stakeholders as we see here today, um, and fostering long-term planning uh, and integration. And one of the things I'd like to say about that last quadrant um, as a trend that I'm seeing around the world is if the city doesn't promote institutional development, institutional greatness, 
um, capacity of leadership, not only within the city government itself, uh, but also within other institutions. This is one of those things that becomes corrosive to a city over the long term and reduces the city's ability to respond in every other way. So this diagram, which you cannot read, but I think is probably in your packets and your booklets, is those 12 different drivers uh, of resilience, which we'll begin measuring within a city, um, are supported by a bunch of different sub-drivers. And I imagine that when you get into this microscopic uh, uh, printing, you will see yourselves in one of those. You'll see yourselves contributing to one of those areas. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but as you can imagine in critical infrastructure, as we look at things like ecosystem management, those of you who are in the room looking at um, managing your watershed areas, for example, will see yourselves in this kind of indicator. So I, I wanted to talk about the first city that 100 Resilient Cities had a workshop in last year, the city of Medellin, Colombia. And I don't know if um, uh, you recognize, does anyone recognize this individual? Pablo Escobar. So uh, Pablo Escobar does not fare well in the story of resilience uh, for Medellin, Colombia. Pablo Escobar, of course, in the 1980s was known as a uh, drug lord, not only within the country of Colombia, um, but also uh, um, uh, perpetuating the drug tr uh, trade and crime around the world. Um, and Pablo Escobar, uh, what many people don't necessarily know, was a migrant to Medellin, Colombia from the rural, rural areas and rural commu communities. And Pablo Escobar therefore represented a point of view within Medellin about economic opportunity. And Pablo Escobar provided livelihoods and opportunity and food and resources to people in the city of Medellin who did not have access to city systems. They did not have access to transportation. They did not have access to formal resources. So Pablo Escobar was the economic engine for many, city, for many uh, cit citizens within the city who had no other choice or no opportunity to get food on the table and to provide livelihoods for their families. And what ended up happening over a long period of time in Colombia was, of course, the cataclysmic crime that was worst, uh, the, the worst uh, place for murders and violence in the entire world over the 1980s. And that conflict that the city had in and of itself about crime and violence and economic opportunity um, led to uh, conflict uh, at the national level with what you will also know as the FARC, um, a revolutionary group who is uh, at odds and at war with the national government in Colombia. And that war continued to escalate and rage for a long period of time um, because of this lack of social cohesion and economic opportunity in Colombia. In the 1980s, you would see and you would diagnose Medellin's city resilience indicators in such a way that you would see that the city was not fostering economic prosperity. It certainly wasn't ensuring social stability and justice, um, nor was it providing public services, particularly in the health area. People were dying uh, at an extraordinary rate in Colombia at the time and in Medellin. No doubt it was not meeting any basic needs and providing for uh, its citizens. And so as we look at the state of Medellin, we can see that it's bereft of many indicators, many drivers of resilience. And then what happened was pretty remarkable. Pablo Escobar was killed. There were advances made in negotiating with the FARC for peace. And within the community, within the neighborhood, up on the mountain slopes of Medellin that Pablo Escobar lived and occupied, 
Commune Trece, there was a group of mothers who seized the opportunity at that moment, at that extraordinary moment, that said, we will seize back our neighborhood, we will take this opportunity, and we do not want our children to lead lives of crime and violence. We want them to have access. We want them to have opportunity. Um, and began working closely with the city, with the mayor at the time, to identify one of the big threats, one of the big risks, one of the gaps that they actually had was this idea of access to the city, the right to the city. Because they lived on this hillside um, where no transportation existed, they began to think about how do we provide our people with access to the city. And so the idea was, very notionally, that they would build an escalator, simply put, a piece of simple infrastructure, down that mountain into the city so people could go and get jobs and get medical care and get services from the city. That idea evolved with city engineers and architects and designers into something really extraordinary. They began to realize that they had a vision of something different. They provided community services uh, and community centers along these escalators. They began to build schools and libraries in this community. They began to self-police and have neighborhood watch groups instead of uh, violent groups like the FARC watching out for them with guns and violence. They began having teachers come into the community. And all of a sudden, Comuna, Comuna Trece was this hub, this neighborhood of extraordinary innovation and invention around access to economic opportunity that transformed the education system, transformed jobs, transformed homelessness, and transformed Medellin, Colombia. So what you see here is an evolution of that one extraordinary brilliant idea in one neighborhood to a transformation of the entire city and the larger region, in fact. So Medellin, Colombia began installing what you see here on the right as gondola systems around the city, providing access for uh, their residents in new neighborhoods and building affordable housing communities at the bases you can see around them. And not only were these transportation systems um, providing mobility and access, they started building hospitals around these, affordable care hospitals around the bases. And when I went to that city, there was also this magical center where, um, where you had transfer between these uh, city systems, the buses, the transportation nodes, the hubs. They were piping in classical music and having artists uh, 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 in these hubs. Um, they had teachers um, giving community advice. So they rebuilt their city and in doing so, built in extraordinary resilience into all of their different systems across the city. So today, as we diagnose Medellin, Colombia, we'll see a couple extraordinary changes, particularly in infrastructure and environment, the reliability and communication, uh, communications and mobility, um, certainly advancements in uh, social cohesion. But by doing those two things that we see in green and fostering long-term planning, you can see a transformation in the rest of the system. By thinking about systems in integrated ways, by thinking about opportunities to transform one system in a better way, in a more cohesive way, to apply to all of the rest of these different dimensions, will create opportunities for resilience and build resilience in the city so that the city weathers shocks and stresses in the long term. Medellin, you can see the trend line there, the peak in homicide rates um, was uh, nearing um, uh, 400 people per 100,000 residents um, in the uh, late 1980s and has declined significantly uh, to 50. That's an amazing change. It was an incredible vision and has built resilience in their city, not only for today, but for the 21st century. So very quickly, the future of urban resilience, where do we see this going now? 
Um, 90% of the world's data was created just in the last two years. 80% of the world's data is currently unstructured. unstructured. Data itself alone is not an indicator of resilience, but how we use data to predict our future and make decisions is an incredibly important part of resilience. What are the patterns and the trends so that we know how to identify our risk? Are we using data to better understand what the conditions are in the next generation? How do we harness that information to make proper investments? How do we look at the technology that will be available to our children tomorrow and make decisions today about where we build and grow and diversify. 75% of infrastructure in cities will, uh, we will have uh, in the year 2050 does not exist today. Think about that, 75% we're going to yet still build. $57 trillion of capital investment um, is planned right now on the books in the United States. How we build those things, how we think about using green as well as gray, gray wastewater management within our cities are critically important decisions for resilience. Thinking about those conditions for the future is in fact what is going to set the city up for a resilient future. Um, inequality and social cohesion will define the resilience agenda. So what you're seeing here is an image in Mexico City of, of course, a slum, a favela uh, on the left, and you're seeing something very different on the right. Um, and what the barrier between the two is a wall of poverty. It doesn't, of course, look exactly like this in Philadelphia, and we don't see many communities like this exactly in the United States, but we do see Ferguson. And we do see Baltimore. And we do see people that are on either side of the walls. And this is an issue of our time. And this is an issue that will define resilience for the future. Resilience tran uh, challenges transcend borders and boundaries. Um, last year, when we were selecting our second wave of cities, we had interviews and telephone calls with every mayor or city manager that we selected. I was on the call with a city manager uh, of Dallas, Texas, the very week that Ebola came to his city. And they were dealing with that crisis and really had no idea how. They fared very well because they had plans underway and the city of Dallas is an incredibly integrated uh, city with some extraordinary leadership. But these kind of boundaries, these kind of geographic uh, physical boundaries don't exist the same way that they used to. And so this is both an economic, this is both an opportunity economically, socially, to get human capital uh, 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 transforming uh, global boundaries, um, but this is also a threat that I'm not certain that we all know how to deal with just yet. And so leaving you on that note, I will also just say that I am extraordinary, ex extraordinarily excited, as I mentioned, to work with the city of Pittsburgh. Our entire team um, believes deeply in the city, uh, just to let you know. Uh, Mike Odermatt, I don't know where he is in this room, he's standing back there, was a huge advocate for your application. He is a native and um, was, will be a, a, a very big ally, um, and I recommend you seek him out and uh, he will uh, share all of his enthusiasm um, for this organization and your city um, and the ability to exchange. Uh, uh, Katya um, Sienkiewicz is here and she'll uh, stand for you. She was meant to be on this stage. I am not meant to be on this stage. Um, Katia is the Associate Director of Relationships, um, and she will be working with you very, very closely and your Chief Resilience Officer. Um, unfortunately, Katia lost her voice, um, and so she won't be saying very much, but um, I, one of the things that I will say, just to give you an indicator of how excited she is about working with you, and all of us are, is um, Katia works primarily with Asian cities. 
Um, she works with Da Nang and Samarang, um, Mandalay, Myanmar, and has an extraordinary background in risk reduction. Um, and Katya came to us last year and said, I, I would really like to work with an American city. I'd really like to um, kind of be an advocate to my, one of the nation cities that, that I live in and I'm from. And we gave Katya her choice of which city to work with. And she chose this one. So she is going to be your champion. And um, from what I understand, we look, we look very forward to you being global leaders. Thank you.